This chapter is going to get into specific ways that we can use computers to commit fraud. Now, when we look at learning objectives, we'll talk about some of the major attacks, some social engineering, and then some specific kinds of malware. We're not going to get too heavy into the technological side of things, but you should know some of the names of the general ways that computers are used to commit fraud. All right, so what are the kind of the processes that we see here? Well, you have kind of some steps that are given here by the textbook. For example, criminals do reconnaissance, they try to use some social engineering, they do scan, execute the attack, cover up the tracks. Um, but a lot of this is, can be kind of defined differently. And in the real world, these don't always follow the exact steps that you're looking at here. We do need to know a couple of terms. Uh, first off, hacking it just means that you are trying to get access to something that you shouldn't have access to. Social engineering is when we talk to people and get them to do stuff for us. So generally, hacking is kind of more, often more focused on the technological things. Social engineering would be to call up an IT help desk and ask to reset an employee's password. So it's not really a technological vulnerability. Instead, it is just sort of taking advantage of people's desire to trust in order to get what you want. We also see nowadays there's a category called malware. Malware is different than hacking. Hacking, again, is a kind of general overview umbrella term. Malware is specifically software designed as to blow things up. Now, this malware can be different categories. One of the common attacks we see nowadays is people that get software that will encrypt people's data. And basically the idea is that they, if you lock people's data, then they have to pay you a ransom to unlock it. But often these firms won't ever unlock it. They just will take the ransom and then walk away. There's a lot of different ways we can do hacking. Um, you might hear some of these terms like botnet, for example, or denial of service attack. These are all just sort of different ways of getting into someone's computer and doing something with it. So a botnet example would be when you download uh, maybe like a cracked copy of Microsoft Office or uh, a video or something. Often what will happen is that people who are criminals will create these cracked copies to, in order to get people to download them to their computer. But along with the software, you actually also have a little computer program that then reports back to the hacker with information about your computer and your setup. They can then use your computer to make further attacks. And they do this to cover their tracks. So they don't want to have FBI show up at their door. So instead, they get you, your computer access and they use your computer to do whatever attack they want. And that's called the zombies. So basically, it's like a, having a fleet of drones, essentially, that you've turned compu computers into that you then use to do your attacks. This is also used for denial of service attacks. So this is when we go to someone's website and it's pounded with requests for connection. And the idea here is that with a thousand or a million illegitimate uh, requests for information, that few legitimate ones get lost in the shuffle. And so your website gets taken down, not because they hacked it, but just because they're overwhelming it with requests. A brute force or a password cracking attack are ways of trying to get into someone's password account. So brute force means we just try every possible combination. You might also find that people use dictionaries of commonly used um, passwords to try and see if one of them matches one of the people in the group there. We've talked about spamming um, or spoofing before. Basically, you send a message saying, hey, I'm from the IT department. I'm trying to contact you to get you to update your password, when in actuality, they're, they're not from the university. Now, we can spoof a lot of stuff nowadays. Uh, spoofing basically means I fake who this is coming from. This can be from email. It could be coming from someone's phone. It could be coming from a text message. But there, there's, sadly, there's a lot of vulnerabilities in our communication network. So it's not insanely hard to send someone a text message saying, hey, I'm from Bank of America. Now, the solution for this is basically you cannot trust anything that comes into you. In other words, if you have someone call you say, hey, I'm from Bank of America and there's a fraud alert, don't give them any information. Instead, look at the back of your Visa card and call that number. And our goal here is say that you don't trust anyone that contacts you first. Instead, contact the bank directly and then they'll route you to the right department. 
There's a lot of other things we can do with computer code that are a little more technical, but basically this stuff is prevented if you have properly patched and updated software. In terms of embezzlement, we see a, ranges, a range of ways you can get uh, money from an organization. One of the classic examples is round down fraud, or basically you steal a tiny bit from a lot of transactions. And over time, it adds up to be a pretty significant amount of money. Another really common one is economic espionage. Disney recently lost a bunch of its um, confidential information. And this was sort of the idea that we want to attack Disney and take information about movies, about what their coming releases are, or their digital assets as well. We see examples of extortion being held today. And the idea here is you find something bad about a person and then you, you force them to give you access to the company's information. There's a lot of stuff going on with cryptocurrency now as well. A lot of the cryptocurrency we can kind of think of as a pump and dump scheme. The idea here is that we want everybody to buy you know, ABC to raise the price of it. Then we sell off all of our ABC and the stock collapses. And you can see this happening with a range of, of areas a day. Um, but basically, we need to think about not being vulnerable to kind of following the whims of the crowd. Instead, try to result, rely upon value investing. Software piracy is another classic example, a way that we get access to people's computers. So this again goes in the category, just pay money for your software and you'll be much better off in the long run. Under social engineering, there's a lot of ways that I can try and sort of uh, get access to people's companies. Uh, this could be identity theft. Um, I get these emails regularly from people trying to pretend to be the dean at WVU. And usually what it is, is they'll try and get you to buy some gift cards from them. Phishing is a classic example where I send them emails, uh, try and get them to click on a link. Uh, we can use typographic uh, URL hijacking. I can make a URL that says wvupasswordreset.com and I send it to you and it looks kind of legitimate at first until you look a little more closely and see it's actually a different extension. I can do things like scavenging and looking through the trash if people are thrown away. I can do shoulder surfing with, I walk up behind someone and try and catch their passwords, I type it in. There's a lot of ways to kind of do this sort of thing. So why do people fall, fall victim to these different techniques? A big part of it is just compassion or just wanting to be nice. So if someone calls you on the help desk line and says, hey, I'm having this terrible time, I'm super stressed, I have this massive presentation, please, please, please reset the person's email so that I can get in, it's really hard to say no to that kind of thing. Greed, uh, you don't want to pay for software or a video, so instead of paying the $3 to rent it, you download it from a BitTorrent site and get a virus on your computer. Sex appeal is a big one with current scams going on these days. Um, a lot of these are prey upon people who are older and lonely. They'll you know, randomly text someone, you probably have seen these messages come in, saying, hey, how are you? And they'll kind of engage you in conversation, um, get you sucked into an emotional relationship, and tends to go pretty badly. Uh, the sloth, urgency, vanity, uh, all these things are ways that we kind of manipulate people to get them to be more likely to make bad decisions. So how do we minimize this? Um, don't let people see your login information, don't share your passwords, and just be generally cautious of anyone asking you for information. Classic example here is someone who calls you saying that they're from your bank and say, hey, I'm from the bank, I'm trying to get access to your, your account because someone's trying to crack in here. I want to authenticate who you are first. So give me your username, give me your password, all that kind of thing. One of the biggest things here is you should never tell someone over the phone about a personal token. So what will happen sometimes is they get access to your password, but then the bank will say, hey, you need to authenticate using this SMS message. Well, the way they'll deal with that is they will get you on the phone, get the message sent, and then you tell them the SMS, and now they're into your bank account. We can see some different kind of classes of malware. There's spyware that just sort of sits quietly and tells people what you're doing. Uh, extortion, one of the classic ones, the key logger. I can plug a little thing in between your keyboard and your computer and then see every keystroke that you make on there. So there's a lot of terminology here. Um, I don't need you to know every single turn, just sort of knew some of the major ones from our textbook and from the discussion. Now in terms of just general password hygiene and general good patterns, one of the first things you need to do is think about how to make good passwords for you personally. 
So a good password, we were told, is often this sort of gibberish. Unfortunately, because they're short, it's actually hard to remember and fairly easy to guess. So if you need to make a password, generally it's better to make it a very long password, because then it's harder to guess. We also want to use things like password vaults. So this is really the best way to do your personal digital history. Um, instead of trying to memorize a password for every single account, instead get something like LastPass, or there's a whole variety of these out there. And it's better is to pay them a little bit of money each month and have them keep track of a bunch of unique passwords. The major problem you'll have with passwords is reusing passwords across accounts. So say, for example, you have a passcode that you use for your Gmail, you've got a passcode that you use for your bank, and you also happen to use it on Netflix. Well, Netflix gets hacked, and then now all of your accounts are vulnerable. Related to this is the idea of having backup. So there's a variety of tools for this. You can do Backblaze, um, OneDrive, Dropbox, but you need to have some kind of online saved version of your data. And this could be something as simple as in case your laptop gets stolen, uh, broken, you have a house fire, flood, you know, all kinds of things can happen here. If you look at hard drive survival rates, we should realize that after about four or five years, reliability drops pretty significantly. So this is the hard drive survival rates from a company called Backblaze. And they basically looked at stats and said, how long do hard drives last? So if your computer has passed four years, you're looking at a pretty increased risk of the hard drive failing for you. And we look at our overall lifetime you know, failure rates, we can see that solid state hard drives tend to do better than the spinning disks. So if you want to be safe and secure, you're probably better off with that. But again, those fail as well. What you can kind of see with failure rates is you will have this sort of infant mortality where things will tend to fail immediately or within a week or two. If they survive, then we end up with sort of a flat rate for a while. And then after the end of their lifespan, they start increasing in failure rates. So I highly recommend using disk backup. This could be something as simple as a you know, $40 USB thumb drive. I recommend getting an external um, hard drive that you can plug in, back up your computer you know, once a week or once a month, and just leave it unplugged in a drawer. One of the keys is you don't want it plugged in your computer all the time. If you get a virus, the worst thing that can happen is your backup is plugged in, the virus locks everything that it finds and corrupts everything that it finds, including your disk backup. So that's why I think it's a really good idea every year or so, buy any one of these disks, throw your files on it, and then toss it into a drawer. In particular, I think about this for your image and digital life. Uh, you don't want to trust that all of your images will be safe on your phone in case something happens to your phone one day. So back everything up onto a disk, throw it in a drawer, and you won't have to worry about it. So overall, I know this is kind of a quick overview of our different techniques for computer fraud. And we're kind of mixing in some sort of general personal ideas as well as some of these kind of larger concepts. But I think it's just good to know what some of the common ways of being attacked are and what you can do to kind of make your personal digital life a little bit safer.